The following Cooking with Carter episode is sponsored by Mitts of Virginia. In just a little bit, we're going to explain what Mitts of Virginia is and does later on in the show. We'd like to take a minute to thank Mitts for all the work they've done in sponsoring Season 4 of Cooking with Carter. Welcome to this episode of Cooking with Carter. I'm DJ Carter. We've got Max over here. We have a special guest with us today, uh, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, he is my sensei and friend. What we're going to do today, we have a question and answer episode. We have about 36 questions that have come in from different people. We're going to say their names, their first names only. We're not going to use last names today. Uh, Max is going to read some of them, and Mr. Whitaker is going to read some of them as well. So we're going to take them one by one. Going to go kind of quick, but I'm going to take some time to explain you know some some theories behind each one some of these questions are going to be what I call show questions which is where I'm going to have to take some time on another episode and I'm going to explain them here today but I'm going to show them on another episode because they're detailed questions so Max if you want to go ahead and start off uh, sure uh, this question comes from Ann uh, what are some tips you have for cleaning up after you do a show alright the, the key here is you want, I use a lot of kitchen towels. Now, I keep about between probably 8 to 10 kitchen towels on hand with me. Uh, I keep them on the fridge door. I keep them on the, fr on the freezer door on my lap. On I the have, cameraman. You know, we have them on the cameraman. I mean, he's, they're, they're folded. We have a person that uh, is also behind the scenes, but we'll get that there, there in just a minute. But as far as cleaning up, you want to make sure when you're dealing with a skillet or getting oil out of a pan or anything like that, you want to be sure to take your time. You want to go very slowly because with hot oil, it does hurt and it can burn you. So you want to just take your time. A lot of times we store them in a, a thick plastic container that can retain heat. And then you want to clean your skillets with warm, soapy water and let them soak. The longer you let them soak, the easier it is to clean them. Okay. Well, that kind of... Uh Answers the next question. All right, go ahead with the next one. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, also from Ann, do you have an aid to help you clean and get oil from your pan? All right, there's this a two part. The the true answer to the question is no. I don't have any aids at all. I have the people that work with Cooking with Carter. Uh, Marshall a lot of the times is the guy that's behind the scenes. He deals with uh, washing and a lot of the dishes because Max is on camera and I'm doing the hosting and cooking on the show. Um, if it is a big pan. A lot of times I will get assistance with having oil uh, dispersed from it into that large area because when you're dealing with a skillet like that, you have to pick it up, turn it over, and pour the oil into a funnel which drips down into the container. So it makes it a little bit more difficult when you're sitting down or doing it from a sitting position. Uh, if I'm in front of the sink, no, it's kind of different because what you would do is just transfer it over. So it's it honestly depends on the situation, but no, I don't have an aid. Yes, I do have people to help me clean. It's the people that uh, work with the show. Max does a lot of that. Marshall does a lot of that. Got a text message in the middle of the show. Sorry. Uh, but it is live. So, all right. So that answers that one. Okay. Uh, this comes from Kathy. This is in reference to the uh, ham <coughs> episode. Ah, that was, uh, where do you typically get your ham glazes? All right. I believe that was episode seven. seven I believe. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, most of the ham glazes, when I do a ham episode, it is honestly... Within the, within the package. Uh, when you buy a ham, most of the pre-cooked hams or the, 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 the pre-done hams, the glazes come in the packages. You can make your own glazes, but that's, uh, I, I haven't had a lot of experience with that, I mean, as far as doing that. But yes, most of the, to answer that question, most of the hams have pre-glazes. Uh, that one was an applewood glaze, which, and if you look at the type of ham it is, the glaze that you use will actually be in the ham as well. Uh, this one comes from Rochelle. Uh, how would you recommend transferring items from a stove or oven uh, when you don't stand well or you have cerebral palsy? All right. This is one of those show questions because I'm going to have to show it, but I want to explain it to you the best I can. Whenever you're dealing with something hot, and the, the, the key problem that people have, especially with CP, if you don't stand well, you don't want to reach up. If you have to reach up to grab something, it's going to make it very difficult on you to slide it down or slide it to the right or to the left. So what I would recommend is if you can stand, sit a chair beside you on both, both sides, on your left and right side. Get to where you're sitting down in the chair so you don't have to stand 
so you don't have to put weight on your legs. When you reach, instead of reaching up, grab the pot or the the uh, the item that you pan that you're picking up, and sit it to the side on the other chair to where it's more even with you instead of having to reach down or up. You can also use a rolling table and sit that beside you so that the movement is one to two, which I, what I mean by that is pick it up and slide it over instead of having to just lift it with it being with it being heavy. Same thing with the oven. You can sit the item on a chair or something that is even with you. If you have counter space, it's a good idea to just slide it over to where you don't have to pick the item up. Okay, and I'll show I'll show that in a, at a later time on a on a uh, we'll we'll bring a, uh, an episode up to show that. Very in depth. Uh, this comes from Harry. How do you deal with hot oil splatter, or when you are frying, how do you deal with the splashing of oil? As Mr. Whitaker say early, I said earlier, I say ouch. No, but but really, honestly, um, hot oil is is dangerous. But I will tell you, most stores. Uh, carry what is called a grease screen. Now, what a grease screen does is it's a it's a thin piece of fabric with metal that is outlined on the outside, and it lays over your pan or your skillet when it's cooking, so that if the grease does splatter, it splatters up onto that that uh, grease screen. Um, now, as far as I have had oil hit me, and this is very hard to say because some people. A lot of people have what's called a knee-jerk reaction. When oil splatters and hits them, the first they're gonna think, thing they're going to do is jerk back because it hurts. You have to train yourself not to do that because the faster you jerk, the more that oil is going to move. The easiest thing I could say is reach over on your temperature control and un unplug your skillet momentarily. Let, it, let, it, let the temperature cool down just a little bit and plug it back in. That'll help avoid some of that, some of that splatter, some of it, it won't splatter as much. And run, uh, run cold water over the burn. Don't ever put butter on a burn. Make sure you get uh, right away, get to cold water. Let it run for about five minutes to clean it. If you notice that it puffs up, you want to get to the doctor, have them check it out. Don't ever put any kind of, you want to watch the salves and things that you, you put on a burn as well. Uh, also from Harry, in uh, reference to knife skills, mm -hmm. uh, how did you learn, or what safety tips do you have? Uh, very, it's a very simple question, and I honestly, a great question, by the way. Knife skills come with practice. Um, there are a lot of safety knives that you can get that cut well, but had the blade that it's, it's designed, and, and the designers made it, so the blade knows the difference between skin and food. You can use safety knives. Uh, I learned a lot of my knife skill from my brother. I learned a lot of my knife skill from my mom, watching them. The key there, if you're not comfortable with a knife, don't do it. Because you need to be, you cannot be timid when it comes to cooking. Because if you are, you are more likely to cut yourself because you're scared. And you don't take the time to practice first and, and do it with a, Take a, a rolling pin and practice the, the motion of, of working, you know, the onion going down or something like that. Don't just cut into something. And the key is your knife has to be sharp. If you have to press down with a dull knife, you're more likely to cut yourself because the knife is dull. If the knife is sharp uh, or has been sharpened by a knife sharpener or, or uh, your knife blade and the knife block, that will make it a lot easier. A sharp knife is your best friend in a situation like that. Uh, this question comes from Steve. How do you keep spaghetti noodles from sticking after you cook them? <laughs> Mr. Whitaker's reply to this one was, eat them quick. I, I like that reply. Um, honestly, uh, the key to that is two things. Uh, make sure that when you, when you are going to cook your noodles... Don't put your noodles in until your water boils. A lot of people make the mistake of putting their noodles in too or too early. When the when the when the there's a difference when the water starts to come to a boil than when the water is boiling. You want to make sure that the water is boiling fully before you take you put your noodles in. Uh, one of the other key ways to prevent your noodles from sticking: salt your water. Uh, salt 
has an ingredient that, that preserves food, but it also is able to break up those fibers so they don't stick together. So salt your water very well. Make sure your water is boiling fully before you put your noodles in. Uh, this one also comes from Steve. Says, uh, "What tips do you have for cooking fried chicken without overcooking?" Okay, uh, Mr. Whitaker had actually. All, we were we were talking about these. There are two different kinds of thermometers. There is a meat thermometer that tells you when your meat is done, and I believe chicken, if I'm not mistaken, is 160 degrees. Uh, yep, yeah, it's a Kelvin. I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, now, the big one for Mr. Whitaker, which he uses, and I wasn't aware of this, is an oil thermometer. Uh, as he mentioned when we were off cameras, different oils are going to have different cooking points. As far as how you cook them, you can check it frequently, and you want to make sure to make sure that it's submerged in the oil evenly. That's another, that's another uh, point with, with, um, with cooking chicken. When you're cooking it in a deep fryer, if you overload your basket, it's going to tilt. And a lot of time, if you overload your basket and it tilts, the chicken will cook on one end and be rubber on the other. So you want to make sure that your basket is never never more than two-thirds full, and make sure that you uh, look at your deep fryer guidelines or your pan guidelines for how much oil you put in, because you can also put in too much oil. So a meat thermometer and an oil thermometer... Um, are, are two very good tools to help you with that. Make sure that your chicken is submerged completely and make sure that you, you, you know, keep an eye on that. Don't walk away from it. Or roll away from or, it. Or, yeah, in my case, roll away <laughs> from it, but that's that's good too. I'll work on uh, that. Steve has another one. Oh, boy. is a bunch. Uh, so what are some tips for cooking vegetables and making them taste good without using fattening products? I tell you, this is a, this is a, that's a great question. Everybody is so, so weight conscious. I want to lose weight. What can I do? I can't cook this. I can't cook with butter. I can't cook. One of the perfect meats for seasoning, uh, uh, green beans, uh, broccoli, uh, you can, uh, in place of bacon. Everybody wants to use bacon. You don't have to use bacon. Smoked turkey is a great, great seasoning for, for, for a great, great seasoned meat. Um, it is, it is very, very simple uh, because it's already pre-done. It doesn't take a lot to it. So I use, honestly, smoked turkey a lot. You can use streak lean, which is, in, in, in the south, it's called fat back. But that, again, is your is your going to be the more unhealthy. But smoked turkey, uh, you can also use different fish. Uh, some fish actually flavor uh, vegetables very well. Tilapia is a good one. Uh, salmon is a good one. It, it, honestly, it depends on really what, what flavor you're trying to uh, achieve. Um, sometimes it depends on, uh, you can batter chicken if you're, if you're doing, uh, say, chicken and green beans. Uh, wheat germ is another great seasoning for, for different um, vegetables and things like that. It has a unique taste, and you, you, know, you want to try it before you start seasoning with it. But that's another one that you can use, especially on Atkins. Um, honestly, one of the, the, the better seasonings that I used is ground, is ground up pork rinds. Only on Atkins now. This is a, this is a, you cannot use flour in Atkins. So a lot of times if you want to, if you want to season something, uh, they did a, a green bean uh, casserole instead of the, um, the French onion uh, noodles that you put on the top, uh, ground, uh, powdered pork rinds and put it on there and put it in the oven and it tastes just like it, it's a fantastic so that's some tips on that and the last one from Steve uh, when should you use dark oil versus light oil or even grapeseed oil okay uh, let me first start off by saying I am not an oil expert okay but I, I will tell you I find that there are so many different types of oil there are co there's coconut oil, which is considered a light oil. Um, coconut oil can be done with fried chicken. Coconut oil can be done with any kind of fish. In my opinion, for fish, I like canola oil. Uh, vegetable oil is your, your quickest heating oil. It's going to heat quickly. Um, Grapeseed oil, I mean, that's, that's another good one. You can use that for a lot of fish. 
it honestly depends on your flavor of taste, of what you, what taste you want to want to achieve. A lot of that's going to be experimentation. Um, it's trial and error. Cooking is doesn't really come with a guide. There's no there's no there's no cookbook that you can say use this oil with this food. They're going to do that, but that's because they've experimented and they've tried different different things to, to go through that. So that's that's the, the best way I can answer that question. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Okay, uh, Carol, and Carol has a lot, just so you know. She has many a question. Oh, boy. Uh, any tips to make cooking easier from a wheelchair? Don't do it. No, just, <laughs> just, just kidding. Okay, um, one of the things, and this is kind of a demonstration as well, uh, one of the things that makes it easier for me, uh, first of all, you, you start off with your, with your cutting and, and preparation surface. Um, I like my uh, preparation surface to be just above my knees. Okay, my 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 belly is right. My my chest is right here. Okay, if it is excuse me, if it's higher than this point, it's too high. I mean, as far as it all depends on what items you have. Um, sometimes one of the things that that when you I notice with with cooking, sometimes you have to turn sideways. To get things to fit just right, it honestly is. It's going to depend on the layout of your kitchen. Uh, I use very heavy knives uh, that, so that you don't have to do a lot of work with pressure. Um, the the pot holders that that go over the hand instead of the ones that you just grab and you, you know you grab the dish with and hold on to it. Um, that kind of thing is good there too. It all depends on, I have an electric skillet that I use instead of the stove because I have a problem reaching my stove. I can do it, but I cook out of electric frying pans and electric skillets that make it a little bit different. I have a deep fryer that I cook out of, a roaster. So it all depends on things that you can bring to you so you don't have to reach up. That whole thing I was talking about earlier with reaching up, it makes it more easy when you have things that are right at your level. Okay, so that takes care of that. Uh, what fish can be cooked at different temperatures? Uh, salmon or salmon, uh, as, as it's pronounced. Uh, I Some people like it well done. Some people like it just barely. Some people will eat salmon raw. Salmon can be made into a tartare. That is another uh, fish. It is a, is a great thing to eat because you can eat it raw as, form, as forms of sushi. Now, you have to know... What to pair with it? Certain rices, certain wheat, certain seaweeds go with it. Uh, it, it honestly, uh, tilapia is another one that can be kind of a medium to a medium rare. Uh, catfish. Now that's not one I recommend that you do medium rare. Catfish you really want to you really want to cook well. Uh, perch is another one. Croaker is another one. It, it, it honestly depends on on your flavor of taste and what you want to do. Um, but honestly, salmon and tilapia and um, Oh, what's another one? Uh, mahi mahi is another one that is uh, can be done as a as a raw preparation in some in some tartars as well. Tuna is a, a raw tartar can be prepared many different ways. Can be poached. It can be steamed. It can be oven cooked. It can be fried. It can be canned. Uh, it can oh. be canned. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Three for a dollar. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead now. Okay. Uh, what can you substitute for mashed potatoes when you're trying to lose weight? Great question. Great question. Uh, one of my favorite things, and this also came from my brother, we'll answer this question and we'll cut to break. Uh, one of my favorite things to make is a cauliflower mash. Very simple. Take a head of cauliflower, uh, break off your stems, and you want to break the uh, cauliflower up into hand-sized pieces. Okay. Once you've done that, get a, get a steamer. You can get any steamer at a, at a uh, the dollar store carries them. You can get them at Food Line. You can get them at any local grocer. Uh, pick them up anywhere. Um, go ahead and steam those for about, I believe it's 8 to 12 minutes. Some of them, depending on how, how you know, uh, tender you want them. Once they're, once they're good and tender, throw just a little bit, and I mean uh, literally a teaspoon of butter to, to a tablespoon of butter will, will suffice uh, a pinch of salt, a pinch of pepper, and take a mixer and um, 
just just mix them down to where it's a, it's a almost a mush. Now, one of the things that that um, Chuck put in, I believe, was just a tad bit of sour cream, and it, and it makes it so fluffy and so good, and it's really good for you. It's a very simple cauliflower mash, and you can you can leave it a little thicker, and it honestly tastes very close to mashed potatoes. And I, I said to myself, how is this cauliflower tasting like mashed potatoes? When you do it properly and you get it the right consistency by not over steaming it, you can get that, that mashed potato taste with just that cauliflower. Broccoli is another one. Broccoli with just a little bit of cheddar cheese, not much. Uh, you can do that. Um, potatoes, you can bake them uh, instead of mashing them. Baked Put, potatoes. Yeah, baked potatoes. Uh, you can, you know, um, it's honestly a, an easy way to lose weight and you leave the skin on because the skin has all that nutrients and all that flavor uh, in doing that. So it's a little, a couple of things there might help you out. All right, so we'll be right back. And when we come back, we'll have Mr. Whitaker read a few on Cooking with Carter. We'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. As I said earlier, we're going to talk just a little bit about our sponsor for Season 4 for Cooking with Carter. I'm with Richard Baldwin of MITS of Virginia. Richard? DJ, thank you. I am with MITS of Virginia, and we are proud to be a sponsor for this season's Cooking with Carter. MITS of Virginia has been in the mobility business for over 16 years now, and we've been supplying individuals with solutions to their mobility challenges, be it vans, home modifications, DME equipment, or just a listening ear if you have a question. Feel free to give us a call, 1-800-420-6470. You can see us on Facebook. We also are linked to the Cooking with Carter site and our website, www.mitsofva.com. DJ? Well, i tell you what, he said it all. As you see the poster here, this gives you just a little bit about what MITS is and does. I know this man personally. He's a great friend and now a great sponsor and partner of Cooking with Carter. We are very thankful to Mints of Virginia and the staff at Mints of Virginia for all of their help. And as we say every time on Cooking with Carter, the meals we make are worth the wait. We'll see you next time.